it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Michael A. Brash, Chief Scientist, Oculus. Good morning. I have to tell you that for me, being here is one of the most astonishing events in a life that's had more than its share of them. Even three years ago, the idea that in 2015, I'd be giving a keynote on virtual reality to tens of thousands of people at F8 wouldn't just have been science fiction, it would have been pure fantasy. VR had been dead and buried for more than a decade and seemed no closer to broad success in 2012 than it had 25 years earlier. And yet, amazingly, here we are. Recently, I took some time to think about how I'd come to this remarkable point, and I realized the thread ran a long way back. The roots clearly lay in a lifetime of reading science fiction, which showed me the path to thinking about VR as not only possible, but as something that I personally could help to make happen. In particular, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash helped me see that virtual worlds were possible way back in 1994, and more recently, Ernest Cline's Ready Player One painted a compelling picture of what VR could be with some breakthroughs and a lot of hard work. What I also realized, though, was that while science fiction novels gave me the conceptual framework for thinking about VR, it was the matrix that made me believe in it. Even though it was based on technology that won't exist for decades, if ever, the matrix gave me a deep sense of what VR could someday be like. Not only how real it could be, but also how exciting it would be to bend and stretch that reality. So I went back and watched The Matrix again, and it was just as fun and inspiring as I had remembered. What I hadn't remembered, though, is that just before we learn that humans are batteries, there's a speech by Morpheus that does a remarkably concise job of summing up what it is that's truly unique about VR. Here's that speech. What is real? How do you define real? If you are talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. That's really all you need to know to understand why VR is not just cool, but world-changing, and why you are going to care a lot about VR sooner or later. Let's dive into the implications of Morpheus' speech. The place to start is with understanding what virtual reality really is. Most people focus on the virtual part of virtual reality, meaning artificially generated inputs to the perceptual system. However, the right place to focus is on the second word, reality. Morpheus asked the question that's at the heart of today's talk, what is real? Then answered his own question with, real is simply electrical signals interpreted by the brain. He made two critical points with that sentence. The one most people pick up on is that we, our conscious minds, never actually interact with the real world. Instead, we interact with signals from sensors in our eyes, in our ears, in our skin, on our tongue, in our nose, in our balance organs, and throughout our body. We only know what those sensors detect, interpret, and signal to the brain. And that's actually a very small subset of the real world. Consider vision. We can't see infrared or ultraviolet. We only have three color sensors. We only see about a two-degree circle in high resolution. We have a blind spot in each eye. We can only see a fraction of the full 360 degrees around us in every direction at one time. We have no blue photoreceptors in the center of our vision and a large blind spot straight ahead at night. And everything but the plane we're focusing on is blurry. Rich as it seems to be, our visual data is actually astonishingly sparse. But even if we were able to accurately record the magnitude and direction of every photon that reached our eyes, we'd still have far too little data to be able to reconstruct the world accurately. For example, <laughs> I'm pretty sure most of you have seen the dress. Is this a blue and black dress in white, yellow light, or a white and gold dress in blue light? Given the photons reaching your eyes, it's an unsolvable problem. No passive sensor is capable of resolving that ambiguity. In order to form a coherent model of the world, our perceptual system has to make assumptions and send its best guess 
to the conscious mind. And this particular picture is so ambiguous that some people see it one way and some the other. It's noteworthy how deeply certain people are about whichever guess their perceptual system makes. They just know they're right. And here we come to the second and less noted part of Morpheus's definition of reality. Real is just electrical signals interpreted by the brain. The way the brain compensates for the limited data it receives is by maintaining a model of the real world that it constantly updates as new data comes in. And it is that model, not the real world, that you actually experience and trust implicitly. Don't believe it? If you're experiencing the real world right now, why can't you see your blind spot? Why aren't you aware that you can't see blue straight ahead? Why can't you tell that you're only seeing an area about the size of your thumb in high resolution? It's because your brain has a model that fills in those gaps with its best guess at the state of the world at every moment. And it's that model that you actually see, hear, feel, smell, and taste. At the core of the reality that each and every one of us experiences lies the fact that we're inference machines, not objective observers. By which I mean that there is, presumably, a real world out there. And your brain is taking the very limited signals coming from your sensors and trying to infer what the state of that real world is based on its internal model. It's one thing to listen to words about how we infer reality, but it's another matter to actually experience it. So let's look at an example where the inference mechanism breaks down. Something is not right here, but what? I'll explain this later, but the key point is that what you see in this video is ambiguous with multiple valid solutions, and your perceptual system has chosen the wrong solution based on a set of assumptions that's almost always correct. The same process happens every waking second of your life. The only difference is that you normally infer the correct solution to the state of the world. The fact that reality is whatever your mind infers from the nerve impulses sent by your sensors based on its model of the world is at the heart of what makes VR different and more powerful than anything that has come before. It's so important that I'm going to spend a few minutes giving you a deeper sense of how ambiguous the world really is as observed through our various sensors, and the extent to which reality is constructed by our minds rather than recorded by our senses. Where better to start than by choosing between a red pill and a blue pill? Unlike Morpheus, I'm not offering you a choice today. No matter which color you pick, we're all headed down the rabbit hole together. So pick a pill and keep your eyes on it. Got it? Let's mask off everything else. Interesting. You were pretty sure that out there in the real world, one pill was red and one was blue. But they're exactly the same shade of gray. The colors you saw were entirely constructed by your perceptual system and existed nowhere else. In fact, let's look at the original slide again. What color are the pills now? It doesn't even make any difference that you know they're both gray. You still see red and blue. So what does that say about how well your perceptions correspond to the real world? Welcome to the rabbit hole. And yes, I know it looks like I photoshopped this slide. By definition, it's hard to show you visual illusions that don't look photoshopped. So your packet contains a physical version of the pills that you can check out later and verify that I'm not cheating. Let's look at some other illusions and what they tell us about how we perceive reality. Some of these may not work perfectly for some of you. It's a bit unpredictable doing illusions on a big screen, but they should work well enough to make the important points. Take a good look at the blue tiles on top of the left cube. OK, now take a good look at the yellow tiles on top of the right cube. You think those are colors you're seeing now? Let's mask off everything but those particular tiles. They're all exactly the same shade of gray. This is similar to the pill illusion we just saw, but it's clearer here what's happening. Your visual system isn't interested in whether the photons coming from a tile in a random image are red or blue or gray. Knowing that didn't keep anyone from being eaten by lions on the savanna. 
What it is interested in is identifying potentially relevant features in the real world under a variety of conditions. When you look at an object, what your eye gets to work with is an approximation of the spatial distribution of wavelengths of light. But what your brain cares about is the actual color of the object. So your visual system constantly corrects for the lighting in a scene. Given the apparent lighting in this scene, the best guess is that the left tiles are blue and the right tiles are yellow. Here's another example that shows that our, your visual system is reverse engineering reality rather than just recording it, this time involving brightness. See the white tile under the desk and the black tiles just outside the desk? Again, let's mask off everything else. And again, they're both exactly the same shade of gray. But if one of them is, that, is in shadow and is that shade of gray, it must be white. And if another one is in bright light and is that shade of gray, it must be black. Your visual system does the inference for you automatically, and what you see is white and black rather than gray. Let's look at how we perceive form next. Here we have a nice square checkerboard. Let's add some dots and see what happens. This happens because some line detectors fire that normally wouldn't be triggered by a checkerboard. When we have a regular checkerboard, your visual system deploys cells with sensitivity to contrast edges at various orientations, represented by this starburst. And of those, it detects high contrast edges at exactly two orientations, the horizontal and the vertical. So you see right angles, as you'd expect. But if we switch to the bulging checkerboard image, and deploy the same perceptual mechanisms to detect orientation, your visual system detects high contrast not only at the horizontal and vertical orientations, but also on slightly slanted axes as well. As a result, the perceived orientation is skewed. Rather than looking orthogonal, the corners look bowed. The checkerboard is a 2D demonstration. Next, let's straddle 2D and 3D. Take a moment and figure out which of the two tabletops in blue is wider as measured in 2D and which is longer, assuming you rotated them to line up. Ready? They're exactly the same size. Think the shape morphed while it moved? So did I the first time I saw it. So let's do this. Take the shepherd's table figure out of your packet. Punch the left-hand table out of the paper and place it over the right-hand table. I'll wait. If you haven't gotten there yet, you can always do this later. Trust me, they are indeed the same size. We live in a 3D world, and the 3D objects implied by the 2D shapes of the tables are quite different from each other. Your brain does this calculation automatically for you, making the assumption that you're looking at a 3D world. That's wrong in the specific case of trying to compare 2D table sizes here, but in general, it allows us to function in a 3D world, which is, after all, where we happen to live. Of course, the world isn't static, so perceiving motion is critical. And while you might think motion is surely simply observation of the world, something is either moving or not moving, right? It is, in fact, where the underlying inferential nature of reality really shows through. Fixate on the yellow dot and observe which way the black and white dots are rotating around it. Next, look at the blue dot. And while continuing to look at the blue dot, see out of the corner of your eye which way the black and white dots are going around the yellow dot now. Move your eyes back and forth, and you'll see the rotational directions change, even though they're not actually changing. If that doesn't work for you, look at either dot, 
then move your eyes up until you see the direction change. Motion detection takes its cues from the highest frequency, that is, most detailed elements of the scene. And when the dots are focused near the fovea, the high resolution part of your retina, the sharp circular edges are the highest frequency components, so the movement of the dots drives motion detection. Away from the fovea, however, there's not enough resolution to pick up those edges clearly, so motion detection is based on the movement of the lower frequency patterns within each dot. Here we can clearly see the interaction of the particular design of your visual sensors with your motion dete detection mechanisms. Most of the time, the two work harmoniously together, but this example shows that that relationship only holds under certain conditions. The next example is an even more striking illustration of this. Here's a video of a carnival ride. Now, take the dark film out of your packet, put it over your left eye like this, making sure to keep both eyes open and look at the video again. Pay particular attention to the chairs, especially as they pass in front of the carousel. Remember, look, hold the film in front of your left eye and keep both eyes open. The chair should pop out toward you like watching a 3D movie. It doesn't work for everyone, but most people can see the effect clearly. You can also see an interesting 3D effect as the chairs cross the trees at the lower right. The reason for this 3D effect is a fascinating glimpse into our perceptual machinery. The less light the retina is receiving, the slower the eye is to send a signal to the brain. As a result of the dark filter, your left eye is signaling the brain later than your right eye. That means the signal from frame N of the video reaches the visual cortex from the right eye earlier than frame N from the left eye. Since your depth perception depends on the relative positions of objects between the two eyes, this delay of the left eye's eye signal means objects moving right to left appear to be nearer and vice versa. Since the nearer objects in this scene are in fact moving right to left and the farther objects left to right, they pop out as 3D, a phenomenon known as the Pulfrich effect. Now let's go back to the first illusion we saw, the Ames window. Of course, the straw isn't really going through the window. What's happening here is that you're making a very reasonable assumption about the world that happens to be wrong. There are a number of cues on the window that imply a perspective that doesn't exist, so your visual system infers that the window is spinning backward for half of a full rotation. As a result, the straw seems to rotate right through the window. This doesn't match any reasonable model of reality, so you end up seeing something impossible. The next example also makes a wrong assumption, but doesn't wind up with an impossible solution, just an incorrect one. Okay, that's just weird. <laughs> Here's what's actually happening. Real objects, especially faces, tend to be convex. So your visual system assumes convexity in the absence of cues to the contrary. The only way to make that assumption work in this case is for the head to be moving in very odd ways. So that's exactly what you see. As the oracle might say, here's what's really going to bake your noodle later on. Now that you know what's happening, try to see the dragon as it really is. I bet you can't do it. A little bit of conscious knowledge isn't going to undo millions of years of evolution in a lifetime of looking at faces. There are many other visual illusions, as well as all sorts of audio, touch, smell, taste, motion, orientation, and balance illusions. These tell us a great deal about our perceptual system, but our model of the world is constructed out of many inputs across all our senses, so multi-sense illusions are even more revealing about the inferential nature of reality. We only have time to look at one of these, the McGurk effect, but it's one of the best demonstrations I've seen of how we construct reality. Bar, 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 bar. 
Obviously, she's saying bar, bar, bar. Now let's watch a slightly different video. Bar, 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 bar. Here we can clearly hear her saying far, far, far. Except that she isn't. The video shows her saying far, but the audio track is still of her saying bar exactly as she did in the first video. The visual input overrode the audio. To make it crystal clear what's going on, let's look at this one more time. Once again, we'll have a soundtrack that says bar, but this time we'll have a split screen with a face saying far on one side and a face saying bar on the other. As this plays, move your eyes from one side to the other and observe how what you hear changes. Bar, 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 bar. The McGurk effect is an emphatic answer to the question, what is real? What you hear depends on what you're looking at, not just at the sounds hitting your eardrums. You aren't a microphone. You're an inference machine that integrates all available evidence to construct the most likely model of the world. In short, reality is what our brain reconstructs it to be, based on our model of the world and the sparse data coming in from our senses. I think it's fair to say that our experience of the world is an illusion, one that evolution has honed to be highly functional in terms of survival and reproduction. Since the primary objective of the perceptual system as it evolved was to stay alive, it operates rapidly and automatically. As the McGurk effect demonstrates, given a particular set of inputs, we have very little conscious choice about the reality we'll experience. That's why the rare cases where you actually can choose the experience stand out like this Necker cube, where you can flip between looking at a cube from above and from below. Which brings us back to virtual reality and why it's different from anything that's come before. VR is about experiencing a virtual world as real. And what we've just learned is that an experience is real to the extent it convinces your perceptual system and brain, because experiences are nothing more or less than whatever your mind infers from the data it receives. And our perceptual system does that inference automatically, regardless of what the conscious mind knows. What that means is that virtual reality, done right, truly is reality as far as the observer is concerned. So what does it take to do virtual reality right? As it turns out, virtual reality doesn't have to replicate the real world in order to work. It just has to provide the right inputs in order to satisfy the relevant sensors and drive, drive the correct inference. To paraphrase Morpheus, some rules can be bent, others can be broken. For example, many of you will get to experience the demo of the latest iteration of the Rift, Crescent Bay, during F8. When you do, I'm confident that most of you will feel like you've been teleported into a virtual world, like you're literally there. And yet, when you're using Crescent Bay, you're looking at photons coming from pixels strobed at 90 hertz, rather than photons continuously arriving from real-world surfaces and lights. That works because the period during which the receptive fields on the retina accumulate photons is about 20 milliseconds. And the structure of those fields is such that they respond just as well to the photons arriving in several short bursts as they do to them arriving continuously from real-world surfaces. Drop the frame rate to 60 hertz, however, and those same receptive fields will start to detect flicker. Drop it to 10 hertz, and motion will cease to appear smooth. In fact, Crescent Bay's display system differs from the real world in many ways. But by taking advantage of the physiology of the visual system, it nonetheless produces the desired signals to the brain. So part of making virtual reality work is learning how our sensors can and can't be driven to send the right signals to the brain. The other, less obvious part, is learning what it takes to get the brain to make a desired inference. For example, remember this? We were able to get the brain to infer a face shape and the corresponding head movement by leveraging the convexity assumption. The same sort of thing is required in a general sense in order for VR to work. And the key to that is agreement between multiple senses and our internal model of reality, especially when it involves feedback loops. 
For example, without revealing too much for those of you who haven't experienced it yet, for many people, the defining moment in the Crescent Bay demo is finding themselves on the edge of a long drop. The response is often to grab a nearby virtual pipe, which shows that enough unconscious inference has kicked in to trigger the automatic responses that mean the, means the brain believes it's someplace real. Why does that happen? While the scene where Neo climbs out onto a ledge outside a building and looks down at 1,000 feet never makes anyone grab for support. The difference is that when you move your head in Crescent Bay, both the motion your vestibular organs report and the parallax your visual system report match the motor signals you sent in your neck muscles and your sense of proprioception, that is, your model of the position of your body. And they do so with low enough latency so that your brain can fuse all those data points into a coherent model of the world. At the core of this is a feedback loop. You move your head, and what you see changes correctly and with an almost imperceptible delay, allowing your brain to maintain the same kind of model of the virtual world as it does for the real world, which then leads smoothly to further motion. That's the fundamental difference between movies and VR. Movies provide similar images, but with no feedback loop for head motion. As a result, we perceive movies as moving pictures on a flat surface, still firmly embedded in the real world. Good VR, in contrast, isn't perceived as pictures at all. It replaces rather than augments the real world. VR is about driving our perceptions the way they're built to be driven. If we can do that, it should be completely unsurprising that it enables us to create new realities. If the technology becomes good enough, VR should theoretically be able in the limit to create not only any experience that's possible in the real world, but any experience that we're capable of having. That's most certainly not the case today, as is obvious as soon as you reach out for that pipe, and it's not really there. VR today is good enough to create experiences, but just barely. In fact, one reason the future of VR is so bright is that there are so many ways it can get much, much better. Let's take a quick look at some of the most important areas for improvement. Since we were talking about the pipe, let's start with haptics. The feedback loop I described earlier was about perceiving the world. The second key feedback loop is the one that allows the use of the hands as dexterous manipulators, as sensors and manipulators. Right now, virtual interaction is limited to game pads and wands, which are nothing like the way we interact with the real world. It's going to take time and some breakthroughs, but I expect hands to eventually be as capable in VR as they are in the real world. Visuals will get much, much better in terms of pixel density, field of view, dynamic range, image quality, and variable focus. And while all that is improving, form factor and ergonomics will get a lot better too. To give you just one example of how much better visuals can get, in order for Crescent Bay to deliver the same pixel density as a monitor at a normal viewing distance, it would have to have a resolution of about 5K by 5K per eye, something like 20 times as many pixels as it currently has. In order for it to have retinal resolution across a field of view of 180 degrees, it would have to have something on the order of 16K by 16K resolution, roughly 200 times as many pixels. VR audio is going to get a lot better fast. Unlike most aspects of VR, no hardware breakthroughs are needed to make this happen, just a lot of compute power and the motivation to figure out how to bring audio spatialization and propagation to consumer products and VR creates that motivation in a big way. VR computer vision and tracking are going to evolve rapidly in a number of ways. Tracking the human body is obviously critical. Virtual worlds won't seem fully real until you can see your own body. And you won't truly feel like you're sharing an experience with others until your brain accepts their avatars as people, which means tracking eyes, faces, hands, and bodies. I expect that you'll also be able to pull the real world into VR. You want to be able to import your coffee cup so you can pick it up without taking off your headset. And ultimately, you'll want to be able to see your keyboard and mouse so you can use them in an infinitely configurable virtual workspace. Finally, you'll be able to map your surroundings so you can stand up and walk around. Surprisingly little is understood about the human perceptual system, and even less is known about how to drive it. It's easy for me to casually say, that we'll be able to use our hands as dexterous manipulators, but in fact, the science and engineering of that are embryonic. Almost all of the advances I've described require much deeper understanding than currently exists, followed by radically new technology. 
So why am I so convinced that VR is going to succeed this time around? The first reason is that VR is already far enough along to enable compelling experiences on consumer hardware, as Crescent Bay makes clear, and will be shipping in quantity before long. The second reason is that there are at least four major efforts to ship good consumer VR within a year or two. When Oculus, Samsung, Sony, and Valve slash HTC are all jumping into a market, it's a pretty good bet that there's something important going on. The third reason is that developing better VR technology is hard and will require long-term commitment. Facebook's acquisition of Oculus was an important moment for this. Once that happened, there was no longer any doubt about whether VR would get the runway it needed to fulfill its potential. The final reason is the march of technology. This was my first computer, a 4 megahertz Z80-based vector graphics VIP system for the bargain price of $6,000. Pretty sweet, huh? It didn't have a floating point unit, so let's generously estimate it at 7 kiloflops. NVIDIA just announced the Titan X, a desktop graphics card that delivers 7 teraflops, a performance increase of about a billion times in about 33 years. That's how technology marches forward when there's competition and a compelling reason, and that's what's going to happen with VR. In short, a lot of powerful forces are coming together right now to make VR happen. And with that, we've come to the end of our lightning tour of why VR has the potential to be a unique, transformational technology and why I think it's going to take off over the next few years. So what does it all mean? Cypher summed it up nicely. It means buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. <laughs> every decade or so, Kansas goes bye-bye in the digital world, and everything changes. Over the past 50 years, that progression has taken us from mini-computers to personal computers to GUIs to the web to mobile. So what's next? It probably won't surprise you that I think VR is the leading candidate to be the next entry in that table, and maybe even more than that. VR is more than just another platform. In the long run, it has the potential to create the whole range of human experience. And while it will be a very long time before all of that potential is fulfilled, the process is well underway. The shift to virtual reality is going to bring huge changes, both for us as developers and for society as a whole. If you think about the implications for work, gaming, and social networking, of being able to experience whatever you want with anyone in the world, in any space you can imagine, it's clear that VR has the potential to change almost everything about the way we live. Lots of important pieces aren't in place yet. No one even knows the right locomotion mechanisms or input conventions, let alone how VR movies will work, or what the equivalent of the Facebook wall will be, or what kind of games people will want to play in VR, or, most important in my opinion, how people will want to interact virtually with each other. But all that will get figured out a process that will open up huge opportunities. And all of us in this room are lucky enough to have a chance to play a part in making it happen. The interesting question is how long it'll be before you personally decide to make the jump to VR. Maybe you'll want to be on the leading edge. Maybe you'll wait for the technology to prove itself. But VR is potentially world-changing and incredibly cool, and it's really happening, so sooner or later, you will want to be a part of it. I'm hoping it's sooner. Thank you.